our careers, our companies, our relationships, and in fact, our entire lives succeed or flatline or fail gradually, then suddenly, one conversation at a time. This is episode number 514 with Susan Scott, Eight Conversations That Lead to Deep Connections. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandy Weiner, and welcome back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to go on your last first date. And to support you on your journey, I wrote a book. It's called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. And it's filled with 30 chapters. Each chapter has a tip to help you step more fully into your value. This week's tip is step 15, be a lifetime learner. This is one of the most important things to me is that somebody's always on a path of growth and learning. And if you are, then you have an open mind, which makes you a better communicator. And that's what we're going to be talking a little bit about today with Susan. So my challenge to you today is if you have something that you've been wanting to learn, a course you've been wanting to take, even just a, a little a podcast you wanted to listen to, just do it. <laughs> it's There's no time like the present to keep your mind active and busy. And before I bring Susan on, I invite you to join our Facebook group. It's called Your Last First Date. And it's a place for women over 40 who want a positive place for growth on their journey to their last first date. We have both single and women in relationships in this group. And it is not a place to come and complain about what's wrong with dating. It's a come, it's a place to come and learn so that you do better because when we know better, we do better as Maya Angelou said. So join us there at your last first date. And now for my guest, Susan Scott, she is a New York times bestselling author and leadership development architect. For the past two decades, she has enabled top executives all around the world to engage in vibrant dialogue with each other, with their employees and with their customers. In her book, Fierce Love, A Journal for Couples, she guides couples through eight must-have conversations that lead to deep connection and lasting commitment. Welcome to the show, Susan. Thank you, Sandy. One, one thing I will say is the journal is... Um, sort of an addition. The book is Fierce Love, Creating a Love That Lasts, One Conversation at a Time. The journal is simply a, a help, you know, to sort of take you deeper into some of the concepts that are in the book. I had a feeling that this was a, another part. Uh, so yeah. one conversation at a time. Yeah. Um, and you have several books out. I know you have many books. You have books on leadership, books on um you know, uh, communication at work. My, my introduction to you was through Fierce Conversations. And I was just showing you before, if you're watching this on video, it's, yeah. it's a very well-read book. Mm -hmm. There was a conversation in here that actually goes, crosses the line between um, communication at work and communication in love. And it, it's a conversation that I have shared with many of my clients because it was so impactful to me. And I'm, I may not get it exactly right, but it was about a, an employee who was a freelancer who was not getting along with their coworkers. And they were called in by the boss to talk about it. And basically through your beautiful guide to how to have this conversation, um, you, you gave a demonstration of how it impacted the work, how it impacted the boss and what was at stake. And this person was given the option of leaving or staying on and getting training. And after being really angry, this person decided to stay on, get the training. And when they got the, the account and everybody was getting along really well, this person got up to talk about how angry they were when they had that conversation, but how it changed not only their work life, but also saved their marriage. And that just telling it just brings tears to my eyes because it is so, it's just so impactful. So did I get that story right? <laughs> For a while, because it was so, such a long time ago that I wrote that book. I'm thinking, okay, what story is that? But now I know what story <laughs> you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is that, you know, that one of the 
big points in that story, Sandy, was um, if you're having if you're having issues because of your behavior or the way you're communicating with people at work, it's it doesn't stop there. I mean, we we really the question that he asked her that really got her attention was where else in your life are you getting feedback like this? Mm. And she was stunned because, yeah, she had gotten feedback from her husband who was not particularly happy, you know, and she realized that the, the problem was not all these other people. The problem was her. She was the issue and she needed to make some changes. And I love that story. <laughs> yeah, we, we are the common denominator. when We have problems and it's so easy to point fingers and say, everybody else is the problem. Why are they so hard to get along with? And it takes courage to take a look at yourself and see where we can make those changes, but it's also quite empowering. Well, and one of the things that I said, I think somewhere in fierce conversations is that, um, you know, if you squeeze an orange, what are you going to get? You're going to get orange juice. You're not going to get apple juice or grapefruit juice or guava juice. You're going to get orange juice because that is what is inside an orange and the orange doesn't care whether it's on the kitchen table or the boardroom table you squeeze an orange you're going to get orange juice and it's the same with people we you know when we get squeezed as in challenged or you know something is going on that we're not happy with how we behave is because of of who we are how we are at that point um and we take that everywhere we go it's not like we we shut off one personality at work and have a totally different personality at home. We tend to think that we do, but we don't really. We take, as you said, we take ourselves with us everywhere we go. That's right. I like the analogy with the juice. <laughs> so Susan, what, what inspired you to focus on communication skills? I focus on the conversation. You know, communication takes so many different forms. You know, there are texts, there are emails, there are, you know, advertising, marketing. And so I'm focused entirely on conversations. And that is because I had, uh, for, for 13 years, I chaired two groups of non-competing CEOs here in Seattle, which is where I live. And each month I had a, a, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each of the CEOs and there were a total of 30 of them. And so that's a lot of, you know, leaders every month that I would talk with. And I'll never forget that, you know, I thought I was doing a good job. I've never thought of myself as a coach, by the way, um, because I don't tell people what I think they should do. I ask questions to draw it out of them so that they have self-generated insight and, and um, you know, really get in touch with their emotions around an issue so that, that that lit match has something to ignite. But I was, I, you know, I'd been, I'd go in and I would chat with them and you know, what's happening. And we would have these great conversations. And, um, and there was one day when I got, I got almost to the end of, of a meeting with one of the guys and I was ready to leave. And he said, you know, wait a second. And what came up, and I won't tell you the whole story here cause it's a little too long, but what came up was he had not been willing to face or to share with me or with anybody else how much trouble his company was in. And, you know, I said, why haven't we been talking about this the whole time? And he said, because I, I, it's hard to talk about. I don't want to talk about it. It's not like I can just turn the ship overnight. Um, you know, we do what we do. And we have all these employees who do that in all of these um relationships that are focused on what we do. And I think that what we do is, is losing its um, appeal. You know, it, this ha happened to be in the fashion industry and he was saying, I think tastes are changing, you know, moving away from what we produce to something we don't produce. And he ended up, I mean, we did take the issue to the group for their input because each group would spend a day together every month to advise one another. We did, but it was too late. You know, and Sandy, I'll tell you, everybody in his group and I, we were, we were horrified that, you know, how did we let one of ours go down on our watch? And so after that, I realized I need to start every one of those meetings with this question, given everything that is on your plate, 
given everything that has your name on it, everything, what is the most important thing we should be talking about? Mm. And that's where we would start. And, you know, in the beginning, when I would first ask somebody that, sometimes they say, gosh, you know, I don't know. And I would always say, well, what would it be if you didn't know? Right. And we would talk about it. But also, I had been reading Heming. I, I read fiction all the, you know, I, all my life I read fiction. That's what I love. It's funny that I've written two, you know, three nonfiction books because I <laughs> really read fiction. But I had been reading Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, in which a character's at a bar in Spain with his friends and they've all been drinking. And somebody asks him, So, how did you go bankrupt? And he responds, Gradually and then suddenly. And I laughed and I had um, an epiphany. It was, you know what? After all, you know, well over 10,000 conversations with these leaders and their direct reports, my, in, and then paying attention to my own life, uh, my, my insight was our, our careers, our companies, our relationships, and in fact, our entire lives succeed or flatline or fail gradually, then suddenly one conversation at a time. And I realized, you know, that's what it's all about. Every single result in our lives, personally and professionally, is the result of the conversations that we had or failed to have. And what gets talked about in an organization, what gets talked about in a relationship between two people who are dating or are together, what gets talked about and how it gets talked about determines whether the company, the relationship is going to thrive or flatline or fail. So, you know, it was, it was a huge epiphany for me to realize that we are, you know, if we look at all of the results in our lives, the ones we love, the ones we don't love, everything in between, and we ask ourselves, well, how did I get here, you know, at this moment with all of these results in my life? Well, we got, we will start to realize I got here one successful conversation at a time, one failed conversation at a time, one missing conversation at a time. And I've, I have come to understand that it's the missing conversations that are the most costly. They are, you know, so it's, it's what, it's the conversations we avoided. Um, for days, weeks, months, and meanwhile, uh, gradually, 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 a suddenly is creeping up on us that we didn't see coming. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I am nodding my head. I, yeah. I just actually finished a call right before this recording yeah. On for I have a have a, a monthly program called the Woman of Value Club. It's a group coaching program, mm -hmm. and I brought finance to the the club because mm -hmm. that's another topic that we don't talk about, and we yeah. have so much mystery around, and mm -hmm. we have so much emotion around, and it's not necessary to do those things. Like we really can get clarity, and be able to talk about anything if we know how to do it. And let me just add that sort of getting in, so, so a big part of my approach, both in the corporate work and in this uh, relationship, you know, fierce love, um, a big part of it is what are we, what are we pretending not to know, you know, <laughs> that is actually happening? And fierce love begins with a true story about a couple that, um, they happened to be in the Lake District in the UK, and um, she had persuaded her husband to go there with her and walk uh, in the Lake District, very beautiful area. He wasn't really thrilled about doing it, but he agreed, and he's sort of stumping along, and they're in this gorgeous setting, and she sees him, you know, in front of her. He clearly looks unhappy, and she their marriage has been sad for a long time. I mean, really, they neither one of them was any good at talking about the tough issues that they had. So they would both shut down or get mad, slam the doors. It would get really quiet, you know, all weekend long. But they're, 
she didn't see the suddenly coming until they stopped for lunch and she said, you don't seem to be enjoying yourself. And he said, well, frankly, I would rather be golfing. That for her was the moment when she broke, when she traveled from I do to I most certainly do not. I am done. And she didn't see it coming. He didn't see it coming. Um, and I, I won't tell you the dramatic way she sort of ended that, but they'll both always remember it. And then later on, you know, when they got back to uh, the U.S., there were all these tearful conversations, but they still weren't any good at talking about these things. And they and they 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 divorced. So I, you know, we always wake up when we arrive at a grad uh, at a suddenly, you know. Uh, you know, whether it's um, the business is, is failing uh, or whether it's I want a divorce or whatever it might be, we wake up when we arrive there. I want us to stay awake during gradually, which is where we spend 90% of our lives. And too often we're asleep at the wheel. We're sort of trying to pretend that it's not as bad as we think it is, you know, that we're probably misreading, we're probably misinterpreting, and we, and we make up stories about our partner, uh, and we behave as if our stories are true, and so often they're not, and we're just oblivious, and then all of a sudden we're, we're we've arrived at a suddenly, and it wasn't a fun suddenly, so fierce love is, you know, how do you stay awake, from the very beginning, when you're dating, how do you stay awake? And what are the conversations that you can have with this other person that will help both of you get really clear about whether or not you even want to go any further? And then if, assuming you do, how do you have those conversations that keep your relationship not only just alive, but just thriving? One woman, she said, you know, every conversation that I had been having with my husband was like a small diminishment. And over days and weeks and months and years, it was as if we had pulled off our own wings. Mm. And that really, that broke my heart. And so, you know, I wanted to answer the question, how do we get our wings back? You know, why... Why are we no longer lovers? We're just housemates. Why does it take so little to send love running out the door? Why do we withhold so much when we are supposedly telling the truth? Why are we so careful in our conversations? And I think, you know, a careful conversation is almost always a failed conversation because it merely postpones the conversation that desperately wants and needs to take place. And then also, what is the conversation that if we could have that conversation, it would, it would, it would really make a huge difference for our relationship. So that, that was my focus of fierce love. Wow. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I want to go back for a second and then okay. I want to talk about this because there's so much to say. Yeah. You mentioned at the beginning that you didn't see yourself as a coach because you yeah. were looking to empower other people, which is exactly what a coach is. So I just it was just funny to hear you say, I didn't see myself as a coach, but you were doing exactly what coaches do. Well, and I think I I have to say, um, this is going to sound like I'm really full of myself and I'm really not, but a lot of coaches have, a, have adopted the approach that I put out in fierce conversations, which, you know, the way I used to think of a coach when I first started Sandy was, well, here's what you need to do. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, this is your issue. You need to do this. You need to do that. And what about this? And what about that? And you already know, and a lot of coaches know now, that is not the way to go. You know, you, you really have to ask the questions, probe deeply with someone to help them arrive at their own um, epiphanies and their own, um, and, and be clear about their emotions. And, and a, 
And so part of the coaching conversation, which has been adopted by many coaches around the world is, you know, given what you've just described to me, what do you feel? And if nothing changes, what will you feel, you know? And if you're on the other side of this and it's beautifully resolved, what will you feel? And you, I mean, emotions um, do give that lit match something to ignite. There's a guy named, um, um, I forgot his first name, Kahneman is his last name. He, he's a, um, a psychology professor at Princeton. He won the Nobel Prize for economics of all things because of his studies that proved that human beings, that'd be you and me, we make decisions and act on them first for emotional reasons and second for rational reasons. And since he came out with that study, other people have conducted similar story, uh, studies and have arrived at the same conclusion. There's just, you cannot argue with the evidence that they, they've come up with. We think we're this rational person. We think, you know, emotions don't necessarily belong in the workplace and they, you know, we shouldn't go there, but boy, if we don't go there, nothing exciting is going to happen. It's so true. I, I mean, even I remember as a young child, my daughter was in high school and suppressing every important mm -hmm. conversation. I think kids do that, adults do that. And she would come home and take it all out at home yeah. because it was a safe space, which it wasn't for her in school. So she wouldn't eat enough. She was starving. She was angry. She had so many emotions. Mm -hmm. And I tried to you know, create that safe space for my children, but also there are limits because you can't just take it all out on your parents. Yeah. And so we all need these, these places where we feel safe enough. And I think a lot of relationships become unsafe. And so I would love to hear you speak to why couples have such a hard time having these honest conversations. I will. And, um, you know, with your daughter, for example, um, and I have two daughters and th they have daughters and, you know, we've got this, all of these wonderful females and with all the issues and the not eating and losing weight and being angry and everything. And so sometimes whether it is with an adult, uh, whether it is in a personal relationship or a professional relationship or a family relationship, one good thing to say, if this feels right, is I get the impression that this, this, this conversation you and I are having is actually a conversation that you have been having with someone else for a really long time. And now you've turned the guns on me, but this is not really, I don't think about me. I think there's all this other stuff going on, you know, this, this ongoing issue that, that really is about you and someone else. Um, and that's, a conversation that's got your name on it. How can I help you prepare to have that conversation? Mm. Can we talk about that? Yeah, that's good. I, I've had that conversation. Well, yeah. now they're all grown up and grown up, the, yeah. the one who was in high school has her own kids. Yeah. But I do have a daughter who is 27, who um, used to do that also with mm -hmm. me all the time. Mm -hmm. And I have said to her, this is a conversation that has nothing to do with me. Yeah. How can yeah. I help you have that yeah. conversation? And even after my divorce, my kids were struggling with their father. And I, I, it was really important that I wouldn't take sides, but that I would help them craft the conversation they needed to have with him yeah. and yeah. to set the boundaries they needed to set and mm -hmm. to figure out what was going on for them because not to go in trying to change him, but to... Mm -hmm understand what was going on for themselves. I think right. we often put the, you know, focus on the other person, they're wrong, they have the problem, like we said in the beginning. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices, your smartphone, your tablet, your PC or Mac, 
Fire TV and any Alexa enabled devices like the Amazon Echo. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. Whenever I'm leading a training session uh, in companies and talking about, you know, here are the, this is about radical transparency. Here are the ways to have these marvelous one-on-ones with, you know, your direct reports, your colleagues, whatever. And here's a way to, to run these meetings where you really get the truth from everybody instead of the party line, you know, you really, and people will often say, oh man, I'd love to have conversations like that, but our culture just, you know, wouldn't, would not welcome it. It's sort of what you're, you know, a lot of people say, is it safe to have this? And, and I, I would always say, when I look at you, I'm looking at the culture. You are the culture. It isn't out there somewhere. You, every time you show up, every time you walk through the door, every time you're on the phone, every time you send a text, an email, you are reinforcing something that is healthy or not healthy for your organization. So don't be thinking, okay, somebody out there has to get it right so that I can show up. That is a losing attitude. And um, you, you could be waiting a really long time. So I know that many of my views are controversial and one of them is people will say, well, it's not safe or I, you know, I need this safe place to have this conversation. I think even Dr. Phil says, you know, this is a safe place to have a woman. <laughs> and part of me always goes, look, we, we, make, we make it safe or unsafe. If, if I am waiting for this other person or these people to be in exactly the right mood and the sun and moon and stars are properly aligned and there's the right music in the background, you know, <laughs> I may never have this conversation. So it really, if I get good at having these conversations, at saying the things that I am thinking and feeling and asking the questions that will draw the other person into a deep relationship nurturing conversation, then I'm the one who's making it safe or unsafe. And I, I sometimes I'll say, you know, when people say, well, I don't know, I don't like the way he, uh, he or she uh, reacts, blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, you know, one of the principles of fierce conversations is take responsibility for your emotional wake. Would you like to be on the receiving end of you? And then sometimes there, there's this quiet moment where they go, <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, oh, maybe I do have something to do with this. You know, maybe it's not all about this other person. Um, so why don't we, why do couples struggle so often in their relationships along the way from the beginning, they're dating all the way through? There are several reasons. One of them is because there is, there needs to be a realization that is missing for most people. And that was, that realization was gifted to me quite a few years ago by a poet from the Yorkshire Dales in England, David White. And he was speaking at a conference I was attending. And he said, you know, the young man who's newly married is often really perplexed, sometimes even irritated that this lovely person to whom he has plighted his troth, you know, that's how they talk in the UK, <laughs> and with whom he hopes to spend the rest of his life, insists on appearing before his face on a regular basis, wanting to talk yet again about something they talked about last weekend or last month. And so often it has something to do with the quality of their relationship. And he's wondering, why are we having this conversation Again, you know, I've told you that I love you. I've tried to be, you know, I mean, what? Could we just have one huge conversation <laughs> about our relationship and then coast for a year or two? And then David said, long about age 42, and he smiled because he was 42 at that time and married. He said, long about age 42, if he has been paying attention, it dawns on him this 
ongoing, robust conversation I have been having with my wife is not about the relationship. The conversation is the relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, and when I heard that, Sandy, I felt like I'd been struck by lightning because I had just left a long-term marriage and that explained everything because my husband and I, neither of us had been any good at resolving our tough issues. And so it, it, you know, it just became very quiet in our house and we were just housemates and a lot's more to it than that. But really, if the people who are listening to your podcast, if when they hear the, the notion that the conversation is the relationship, if they recognize there's something to that, well, then if the conversation stops, you know, you can do the math. Or if you and I add another topic to the list of things we can't talk about because it will wreck another weekend, then all of the possibilities for our relationship become smaller and smaller. And all of the possibilities for the individuals in the relationship become smaller until one day you overhear yourself making yourself quite small behaving as if you're just the space around your shoes, engaged in yet another three minute conversation that is so empty of meaning, it crackles. So <laughs> coming back to what I said at the beginning of this is what gets talked about in a relationship, how it gets talked about determines whether that relationship is going to thrive or flatline or fail. And we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to address. We don't, we're not even that good at um, letting our partners know how much we love them and why. So the occasional love you, you know, as somebody's heading out the door, it, uh, it, it's not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's not the same as saying something like I overheard one of my daughters say to her husband, she said, you know, I watched you help the girls with their homework last night. I do not know how you got to be such a spectacular father to young girls. You were just amazing. I just love that about you. Well, you could just see his heart practically beat out of his chest. That, you know, to let somebody know specifically what it is that we love about them. You know, I love the way you come up behind me and put your arms around me. I love, you know, so we need to let people know what it is about them specifically that we love, that we really appreciate, as well as if something isn't going well, we, we need to have a way to talk about that without having it turn into an argument and uh, without triggering <laughs> your partner or yourself, um, which, you know, everything goes south in a heartbeat when that happens. So how, you know, we didn't, nobody taught us. I mean, nobody taught me how to have these conversations. And I grew up in a house where there was a lot of unhappiness and fighting and yelling. And, you know, th that wasn't a good, a great lesson for me. So I didn't know how. And, um, but it, it makes all the difference once you know how, and it's not difficult, it isn't complicated. You do not have to have a PhD in psychology. You do not have to be a marriage counselor. You do not have to read a gazillion books about you know relationships and philosophy, except for years and mine, right? <laughs> but, but mine focuses only on the conversations. And there are eight of them and they're really powerful and simple. And each chapter has a, you know, a, a true story names changed, of course, true story um, about a couple that illustrate what was happening or what wasn't happening. And so here's the conversation they needed to have and here's how they had it and here's what happened and here's your roadmap if you feel like this would be a, a useful conversation for you to have with your partner. Here's your simple roadmap and here are some words you can use. You don't have to use them, but here are some. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. And so yeah. that's, it's just that nobody taught us how. And yeah. we, we keep pretending not to know that there is trouble. Uh, and 
I think it was Carl Jung who said, what we do not make conscious emerges later as fate. And another way of saying that would be, you know, if a problem exists, it exists whether we talk about it or not. So we, we, we need to talk about it. Yeah, that elephant in the room is visible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, it's, I, I'm thinking about my marriage as you're talking and mm-hmm. I, I didn't have the skills I have today, but I, I knew that I wanted to have these conversations. Mm-hmm. It was always important to me mm-hmm. and he would just walk away from yeah. any conflicting conversation. I mean, literally we'd be on a walk and I'd start to talk about something and he'd just turn around and walk the other way. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that stonewalling yeah. was so destructive. And um, there were so many things that I see now in hindsight that it was really hard for us to make our relationship work. Mm-hmm. And I still had stuff to learn. You know, I, there was stuff that I needed to take responsibility for and not just say, well, he was a stonewaller and he got defensive and he was critical. And, yeah. you know, but I was also triggered and I, I would shut down and oh, do all yeah. kinds of things. And you know what? I am pretty positive that almost everybody who's listening to your podcast will, can relate to what you just said, because we've, most of us have had that experience. Here's, here's something very useful. And I hope that everybody listening to this really pays attention here because this is powerful. Remember when I said we need to stay awake during gradually? And, you know, so that we know, are we headed toward a ditch or are we right on track and headed someplace where we both really want to go or what? So we do, this is not a new idea, but I, I, I don't think we get it. We do teach people how to treat us and we get what we tolerate. So, you know, you hear somebody complaining, you know, my husband or my boyfriend or whatever is and it's like, okay, what are you doing about it? Complaining to me is not going to change anything at all, but we don't know how to do it. So here's a simple thing to do. And there's a whole chapter on this, but this is really good. Keeping in mind that human beings make up stories about other people and then behave as if their stories are true. We need to catch ourselves in the act. You know, he did this, he said that, I'm saying he, and it could be she too, but you know, he did this, he said this, and what that means is this and this and this and this. And when we take it to this really dark place, uh, that may or may not be accurate. So in the moment, so that we stay current, so that we stay awake during gradually, If your partner, your boyfriend, your girlfriend does or says something that feels hurtful to you, then right then and there, you can say, hey, you know, what you just said, it it didn't land well with me at all. You know, can you tell me what is going on? Full stop, right there. And now you're inviting a conversation, not starting an argument. So you'll find so often that you have this reaction, you didn't like it, it didn't feel good, it felt hurtful, it worries you. And you told yourself this little story about, oh, 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 oh. But you say, okay, I noticed this, you know, this just happened. Can you tell me what's going on? What they say will usually not always but usually help you understand oh wow that you know that's what is going on with this person it's not that 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 he or she hates me or is you know um you know thinks i'm a terrible person but if you don't let people know that what they just did or said is not good you, you know and i remember saying you know you and i talked about our mothers before this before we started recording it. <laughs> I had a mother who, I'll tell you, she could really go off. She could just go off. And I finally, I remember saying to her one day, I'm going to go and take a little walk. And I'm going to walk around the block. And when I come back, I need for you to have found a different way to talk to me because nobody gets to talk to me like that. Nobody, not even you, my mother, who I love. 
See you in a bit. And I walked out the door and left her standing there, you know, with steam coming out of her ears and all. <laughs> and, when, and when I came back, she was a different person. She didn't apologize or acknowledge, but she was a different person. So sometimes we need to say, I need for you to find a different way to talk to me. This, yeah. this is unacceptable. But tone of voice, how you say that is important. So if I say it like I'm shooting at you, you need, you know, or, that's not, that's not good. But just simply, hey, I need for you to find a different way to talk with me because that was painful. That, you know, was hurtful. Can you tell me what's going on? Those magic words, can you tell me what's going on? Uh, that has resolved so many issues. I can't even tell you. So there's a tip, just a small one from Fierce Love that should help you navigate and stay current during gradually. Don't let it build up. Don't shove it down, which is what I always did. I just shoved it down and, and sort of seethed and stormed and built it into some kind of monstrous thing lurking in the corner when maybe it was, but usually it wasn't if I had known how to just address it. That's such a great tip. <laughs> the stories we make up, man, and also how we let people speak to us. I mean, yeah. I, I I just was listening to a podcast this morning where people were calling in for advice. And <laughs> this one woman was saying that she's been dating someone for about six weeks and he's a single dad, she's a single mom, so they both are busy. Mm -hmm. But the last week or so, his communication had, had dropped and he had the cadence had changed and she noticed it, but she didn't want to be needy <laughs> by bringing yeah, up what she did. She would also start telling herself the story. Oh, he doesn't, he's, he's losing interest. He exactly. Doesn't. The yeah. whole story is there. Yeah. So by the time often we have these conversations, we're yeah. already so convinced that this person is whatever we thought they were, yeah. that we can't stay untriggered. We have these conversations in a way that's so off-putting. Yeah. And it basically, she just needs to have a conversation. Yeah. I noticed the cadence has changed. Is everything okay? What's going yeah. on? Yeah. And that's it. You know, it's, yeah. uh, it doesn't no, have to I'm, be any more than in, that. Uh, uh, in, the, in the early stages of my relationship with the man in my life, um, that happened, you know, uh, and I, would, I had texted him and I didn't hear anything back. And usually he, he would get back. That happened. And I'm thinking, oh, gosh, he must you know, maybe his feelings toward me have changed. And I just was really concerned about it. Um, I, I told myself, and this is me knowing what I know, you know, I have to catch myself in the act of making up the <laughs> stories. And finally, I thought, wait, you're doing exactly what you counsel people, please don't do that. And I texted him and said, you know, I haven't heard from you in a couple of days. Can you tell me what's going on? I got a text back almost immediately and it said, yeah, yeah, um, can I come over and let's talk? And, I, and even then I thought, uh-oh, uh-oh, you know, <laughs> something bad, it, this is a breakup. And he came over smiling with flowers and love and hugs and everything. He says, this is, you know, my crazy, crazy schedule. This is what's going on right now. You know, and this was all about this and nothing about us. I love us and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, wow, I put myself through a good 24 hours of concern and sadness and you know already starting to miss him because I figured he was leaving and <laughs> he wasn't but you know if he had if he had been ready to to leave it would have been useful for me to know that as well right, right. and we're afraid to hear that we're yeah. afraid to hear this person isn't interested anymore yeah. And people drag that out for years. Oh, uh, you know, I want to have kids. You don't want to have kids, but we don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Or we don't want to talk about the fact. Your mind. You're, you'll change your mind someday. Yeah, yeah. maybe because he loves me so much, he's going to change his <laughs> mind. <laughs> That'll happen. Yeah. You can look that up under fat chance in the <laughs> 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 oh my God. So let's, let's talk about the eight must have conversations. I want to jump around a little bit about those instead of just taking them in order and we might not even have time to talk about all of them. But one of them, okay. one of them that's really important comes from a, another realization that I want people to have. And um, the story in that chapter is about a couple who visit, were visiting with me. I hadn't seen them in a couple of years. 
they're telling me everything that's going on in their lives. They're just smiling and smiling. Everything's perfect, perfect, perfect. And I just had this feeling, okay, I'm listening for the words in between the words. I'm listening for, you know, what you're, what, and I finally said, is there something you're not telling me? And the husband, he's like, I just, I literally watched him, Sandy, shrink his subatomic particles and become very small <laughs> beside her. <laughs> and it was very quiet for a moment. And it came out that he had had an affair. And it was heartbreaking, you know, it was terrible. It was it almost ended their marriage. And, uh, but he had stopped the affair and they were back on track and they were happy. And she said, we believe in unconditional love. And she turned toward him and with these adoring Nancy Reagan eyes <laughs> said, there's nothing you could ever do that would cause me to leave you. I think I shocked all three of us, Sandy. I think I jumped out of my chair and said, take that back. <laughs> you just <laughs> gave him permission to have as many affairs as he might want to down the road and you will go through all this pain, but you will never leave him. And, and I said to him, please don't, don't misinterpret. I'm not saying that I think you're going to, but she's just given you permission to. So, there we need one of the one of the conversations is we need to clarify our conditions for ourselves we that's a conversation with self first and then it's one that you know you share with your partner and and ask him or her to 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 go through the same thought process you know what are your conditions and it's not about i kind of would like this and this and this i remember one woman with her list of all the characteristics and attributes she wanted in a man and i thought oh my god that if I were a guy and I saw that list, I'd run for the hills. You know, <laughs> that is a long list. I mean, that is just <laughs> ridiculous, just ridiculous. Um, so conditions are, are just the few non-negotiables, the few things that must be present in your relationship for you to want to stay in it. And it's, a, it's, a, it's really important to think about and to, to clarify for ourselves, really, what are those? What are those? And to what degree am I experiencing that with my partner? Or, you know, is it missing or is it partially missing? Or can we ramp this up a little bit? And might his conditions conflict in some way with mine? You know, that, that's an interesting conversation. Usually they don't, but it would be interesting to know. So that's one of the conversations, you know, here's, here's where I, I want to go with my life. And here's why I want to go there. And here's how I hope to get there. And then who's going with me? Because, you know, I remember a woman telling me that her life story and her story was before Jack, during Jack and after Jack, and it was all about Jack. And it's like, well, where are you in this story? <laughs> are, you, are you anywhere in this story? If you're depending on this other person to complete you, you know, to make you whole, um, you are in for a bad day because that's unrealistic. It's unfair. What a burden you're putting on this other person. It's, that's not fair. So I think we have to come to terms with, you know what, very often this is mostly about me, not always about the other person. I think it, it is, but when I really have a conversation with myself, especially asking myself, would I like to be on the receiving end of me? You know, how, what kind of a wake am I leaving? Um, there was, you, you know, the Lewis and Clark expedition, there was a book written by that, about that. And I don't remember whether it was Lewis writing to Clark or Clark writing to Lewis, inviting this person to go on this expedition. But the title of the book was taken from a little one sentence in that letter. And that sentence was, I should be extremely happy in your company. Hmm. I love that title. Mm -hmm. And that's what I ask myself, am I speaking and behaving in a way that my partner would be not just happy, extremely happy in my company. And that stops me short if I'm starting to, you know, 
forget all the, all the kind and loving ways that I want to converse with someone. Um, and, and brings me back to, you know, this is really, I, I am modeling, I am modeling what I would like, um, but I cannot ask of someone else what I'm not even doing myself. So that's one, you know, it, 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 it's, it's about clarifying your conditions. And, yeah. um, what, and, and, and one of them is about, you know, how do you give feedback? And I've already actually already sort of touched on that, you know, this, you said this, you did this, can you tell me what's going on? I mean, that is so powerful. And there are stories in that chapter that, you know, how, how that was so useful, so powerful, so helpful. I had a client yeah. recently who was so worried about feedback yeah, because it had been so harmful and hurtful in the past. And I said, you know, I'm a member of Toastmasters. And one of the things I love about Toastmasters is we get to be evaluators and give honest feedback to mm -hmm. people within two to three minutes. So it has mm -hmm. to be short, concise, yeah. but we start and end with the good. You know, mm -hmm. we start with what are three things we appreciated what are three areas of improvement? And then what's a challenge? And good luck. We can't wait to hear your next speech. It's it's a similar way that I teach giving feedback to clients um, with you know within their relationships because we don't know, again, we don't know how to give feedback. We think it's, oh, let me give you some really honest feedback and it's just criticism. And it's oh, and not you know, if somebody comes up to me and says, would you like some feedback? My <laughs> response is absolutely not. No, thank right. you. I, I'm not having any of that today. <laughs> Keep it to yourself. <laughs> right. But if it's in within the context of a romantic relationship, then you yeah. need to hear feedback. Yeah. And but it has to be spoken in a way that is actually going to support you, not just because I want to get this off my chest yeah. and it'll make me feel better. Yeah. So there is a way to do all of these things. And the non-negotiables are, they're, they're important in every relationship we have. Mm -hmm. I would say that within with clients, you know, the clients that I have in my practice, they fit into my non-negotiables and I fit into theirs. And yeah. we have we have a discussion when we first start coaching to design our arrangement. How are we going to be together? We talk about that before we even start our relationship. Because if we don't design our alliance, I won't know what your triggers are. You won't know what mine are. You won't know that I expect you to be on time or this is going to happen. Yep. We have to put all these things up front. And if we can do that in every relationship, people would be so much happier and clear ab mm -hmm. about what, what the expectations are and how whether we decide we want to stay or go. The simplest definition of a fierce conversation is one in which we come out from behind ourselves into our conversation and make it real. But we need to do it in a way that describes reality from our perspective without laying blame that's a part of the skill we need to get good at, to surface and tackle our toughest challenges, to provoke learning for everybody involved and to enrich relationships. So if I've done the first three, but I am trashing the relationship, it was not a fierce conversation. Fierce love begins with this really short poem by Hafiz and I just love it. It's, it's all just a love contest and I never lose. Now you have another good reason to spend time with me. Mm. And that's what Fierce Love, the book, is all about. You know, how do you how do you behave? I mean, you can't you can't make yourself love someone. You can't make them love you. And but you have to understand, love does not make itself. We make it, or we fail to make it, and we're pretty darn good at unmaking it as well. So, I mean, it's not as if God is out there ex machining everything that happens in our lives. This is up to us, how the amount of love that we have. And so um, I just need to realize that this is up to me. So what I need to do is speak and behave in a way that would entice love, if it happens to be in the neighborhood, to want to spend time with me. And... You know, that's, it's a beautiful journey to go on when you start to get that, you start to understand this, that this is about me, this, I get to say yes or no to any relationship, so does the other person, why don't we start out by being really truthful with one another, for example, 
I remember um, being with one of my friends and she was kind of flirting with some guy at a party we were both at. And he, you know, he talked about, he had season tickets to the Seattle Seahawks, you know, you just love football. And he said, do you like football? And she said, oh, I love it. And I had to well, kind of walk away because I know she does not love football. And I thought, well, you, if, if you end up with this guy, you're going to spend a lot of your Saturdays, you know, during a part of the year in front of a football game that doesn't really, ca- I mean, it'd be fun to hang out with him perhaps, but you don't love football. I mean, why would you do that? You, why would you say, why don't you just say, I think football is such an amazing sport. It's not my cup of tea, but I, you know, and just move on. Yeah. So, you know, we do, <laughs> we, we need to show our cards early because it's not fair to say, oh yeah, I love this, I love this, I love all the things that we think this other person wants to hear, because they're going to find out sooner or later oh. we were lying. We were lying. So <laughs> true. I, yeah. I, I dated a guy who was into football, and I, I said to him, <laughs> I, I am not into football. I said, yeah. but I would love to watch a game with you and have you explain to me what you love so much about yes, football. Yes, <laughs> that's a great response. But that does not obligate you to watch every single no. game. No, in fact, I didn't good. last half the game. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like, thank okay, you so thank much. You <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I was dating someone years ago and, um, and I asked him, you know, are you an avid golfer? And he said, no, no, you know, I, I have golfed, but I'm not an avid golfer. And I said, well, that's helpful for me to know. Cause I don't golf. Um, you know, golfing, if you're going to golf and be, and enjoy it, you have to be halfway decent at it. And to be halfway decent at it, you need to play a lot of golf. So you develop your skill. And I have just so many interests. I don't want to focus it on the sport of golf. So I know so many women who are sort of golf widows, you know, their husband is off playing golf, you know, during the weekends. And, and it was really interesting later on, what did he do? He started playing a whole lot of golf. <laughs> and I said, you know, that's fine for you. You know, I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> yeah, I would rather go to a play. I would rather take a long walk. I would rather, you know, hang out with friends, family. I would rather do almost anything than spend the day on a golf course. Golf course. Yeah. I, we, you know, even in an online profile, when I write a profile for someone, I make mm-hmm. it highly individualized. It's yeah. not a one size fits all. You don't want to attract everybody. You want to attract in somebody who's going to be attracted to who you are, not who you show up as until they get to know you. Yeah, I so, think it is so cool uh, that you will write profiles for people. That would, I wish, I wish when I was doing online dating I wish I had known you and known about you because I would have come to you and said Sandy you know I don't know what you know and that would be hugely helpful yeah <laughs> I actually just just wrote one I'll read you a little bit of it because oh, it's yeah. a really fun one yeah. um so she told she said I have them fill out a questionnaire to learn more about them and she mentioned that she's really into the Marvel superhero um, oh, right. movies yeah. Yeah. that she just discovered. So I wrote it as a leading lady auditioning for the role of superhero in the second <laughs> chapter of her life story. Oh, how fun. And so it goes on to describe this person as, well, the perfect candidate is kind, loyal, loves dogs, and has a great sense of humor. He's got the charm and sweetness of Spider-Man <laughs> and the bravado and vulnerability of Iron Man. He enjoys quiet vacations, reading with his MJ, who's Spider-Man, girlfriend by a lake in the country spending time with friends hiking and eating sushi and then I describe her his leading lady is a straight shooter she tells it like it is with kindness and warmth she's known as a sarcastic ray of sunshine and she loves reading books like the secret keeper and between the two kingdoms and I go on to that's um, talk about right it's, so it's it's fun it's fun to read yeah. and then at the end I say if you qualify for this role please send a message let's get off the site and create our own marvel us oh, life together that is brilliant Sandy. thank that's you so good. <laughs> I really like that. And, and you're right I mean you you made her a unique individual and 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 that profile would clearly message 
not only who she is, but who she, she would want to meet. Right. And that, that cuts through an awful lot of <laughs> other possibilities that, that wouldn't fit. So that's, I love that profile. Oh, thank you. It's fun I'll to I'll never write. forget. I, so, what, so, you know, one of the things that I wrote about in Fierce Love is how we write these long lists. I want all these characteristics and everything. <laughs> And um, I have a friend who had her, her list was very, very short. It were like four things on it. But the fourth thing was your Star Wars Death Star table lamp is not coming into my home. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, and the guy's going, something happened to her with the Death Star <laughs> table lamp. <laughs> he had one and you know she, to her it was probably the ugliest thing she'd ever seen and she right. it was like so she was trying to signal to him yeah yeah right <laughs> <laughs> that's great yeah. uh susan this is such an incredible conversation and i could talk to you for hours <laughs> i just i people should definitely get the book because there's so much wisdom in here you just have a way of helping people to put words to feelings to be able to say things in a in a simple way and to be honest and authentic, which is really what dating should be and relationships mm -hmm. should be all about, you know, not putting off these conversations to till you have this magical moment or feel comfortable enough. The most important time to have these conversations are now <laughs> in the moment. Yeah. Um, do you have any final words to say for anybody who wants to go on their last first date? By the way, I love the name of your podcast. Thank you. That is so good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I would say this. I, I hope that your listeners resonated with the message that the conversation is the relationship so that they understand I am navigating this relationship one conversation at a time. That just understanding that is so important and then um you know the book will the book will it's a it's not a long read it's a short read with true stories in it and, um i think it'll be very helpful and then it's just sit beside someone that you care for and begin and you might even want to begin with the whole you know i want you to know something specifically that i absolutely love about you you know it's this and the person we don't get feedback like that very often. We just get a thanks, good job, at a boy, at a girl, love you. And well, there's nothing wrong with those. It, it doesn't. It doesn't do the job. So sit beside someone you care for and begin. I love that. Mm -hmm. I just started a ritual with my son when he comes to me on Friday nights for dinner, where we're talking about what we love about each other and if there are any areas where we want to ask for forgiveness. Oh, I came across something that said, you have to learn to accept an apology you will never get. Mm. So, you know, for anybody who is hanging on to resentment, anger, hurt, pain, tears over something that somebody did and they have never acknowledged or apologized for it, accept that apology you are never going to get and move on yeah hanging on to resentment mm -hmm. is just eating you up yeah and i mean who wants to hear your sad story over and over and over and over again you know it's like my focus is always okay given that this is the situation what are you going to do you know what's next so yeah we're going in the past and in going over and over that and inflicting that same sad story on other people over and over again that's not yeah that's not an attractive narrative no <laughs> don't bring that to your dates <laughs> um, Susan this was delightful if you can share with our audience the best way for them to find you please well to find me I think you can go to Susan Scott dot I O. And you can find the book, Fierce Love, Creating a Love That Lasts One Conversation at a Time, anywhere, whether it's on Amazon or anywhere, really. And then there is the companion piece that you spoke of. It's a journal for couples that is also really helpful to spark conversations with the partner and take them deeper. But start, you know, I mean, if you were only get, going to get one, get 
the book Fierce Love. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for doing this important work and expanding it into love because that helps so many people. And this is just, it's, it's, it's crucial to have these conversations. Well, thank, thank you. you so much for in having me as a guest on your show. And I just think what you're doing is so important and valuable and I applaud you. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks everybody for listening today. And if you love our show, please, please rate and review us, share it with a friend, and we hope you go on your last first date very soon. If you are ready to get unstuck, gain new tools, become more empowered, and finally find your last first date, I'd love to talk to you. Fill out an application to be considered for a complimentary half hour love breakthrough session at lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. That's lastfirstdate.com forward slash application. I look forward to talking to you soon.